Hello and welcome to Movies and Tea. I'm your host as always, Owen Jones, and joining me of course is my co-host, Miss Kim Love. Hello. On tonight's episode we continue our re-evaluation of the filmography of Heo Mirazaki as we move on to My Name of Totoro from 1988. The second film to officially be released by Studio Ghibli after Laputa Cast in the Sky. This one coming two years afterwards as part of a double feature with probably the most unlikely uh, pairing that Studio Ghibli could have gone with as they chose to pair this with Graveyard of the Fireflies, a probably the most polar opposite movie you could probably think to post with this charming movie about two young girls moving to the countryside to a house that's uh, nearby the near to the hospital that the mother is currently staying at only to find that the local house the house as well as the surrounding forest is inhabited by forest spirits including the gigantic forest spirit Totoro so Kim I mean this one is safe to say is one of your favorites Yes. How many times would you say you've seen My Neighbor Totoro? Is it just too many to count at this point? It's probably too many to count. I mean, I watched Totoro when I was really, really young. And it it was like the, the Cantonese dub that I would watch back in the day. And it's only been like recent years that I've watched um, the English dub, mostly because the <laughs> Cantonese dub is on a crappy VHS, yeah. which doesn't work anymore. So... <laughs> We had to upgrade ourselves. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is um, one that I've only seen a, a handful of, of times. Um, and I mean, it's safe to say that while Spirited Away was obviously the film that introduced the world to the films of Studio Ghibli, I think it's Totoro is the character that has infiltrated pop culture more than any other, and dare I say, any other anime character. Um, I was trying to think today of like another character in anime that has like had such an impact on pop culture that Totoro has and I really sort of struggled to come up with any sort of other character that comes even close to matching the wild popularity of this character who's now even in the Toy Story franchise um this giant forest spirit that apparently if we're to believe uh, Murasaki he lives on acorns though judging by the size of it how many acorns this thing eats i have no idea <laughs> as i said already this film came two years into Stuart ghibli's existence um they originally faced with following up uh, the pewter with the whether they do two films with a six month turnaround between or they do two films and release them simultaneously and it was that option that they actually went with with many of the artists from the pewter coming across to work on this film uh, this film was also shot in the studio b of studio ghibli which uh, had free animation tables and which meant them obviously having to share with the team who were making uh, graveyard of the fireflies as well but both films released to critical acclaim only furthering the reputation of the young fledgling anime co- company um, but with my name of Totoro, I think this is Murasaki at his most whimsical. Um, Sunny draws inspiration from his own life, as um, when he was a child, his mother was hospitalized for nine years with uh, spinal t- tuberculosis, similar to the two girls that we have at the center of the story here. Um, the two girls are Satsuki and Mei, Mei being the representative of Murasaki age at the time and Suzuki the more the the young man that he would uh, grow into and he cited that if he had made them boys that it would have been too painful a film to make so that's why he made them a uh, pair of sisters but this character Totoro I mean you can trace it all the way back to even prior to uh, the foundations of, of, of Ghibli so originally he was a character that he was like had been doodling while he was working on it for another animation company and had originally planned to make it into a children's book but when offers to turn it into a feature started coming along that he sort of changed the focus and moved it onto the two sisters but here kim i mean obviously we here we obviously have these two sisters Suzuki and may what's your sort of feelings on these characters because they're kind of like 
much like uh, with this film and Gary of the Fireflies, they kind of opera ends to each other. You've obviously got May, who's uh, sort of uh, the younger, sort of hyperactive one, and then you've got Suzuki, who is trying to keep her sister in line and uh, play the sort of surrogate mother role. It's nice because they create a balance. Like, one of them is, you know, Suzuki is more... Uh, is like an older like she's she's like a parent almost um she takes care of her father even some of the responsibilities of being a parent like the lunch boxes and all that stuff and you have may who is kind of the opposite she's still at that age where her imagination is very vivid and she you know she imagines a lot of the things with the things with the things that are unknown to her creating little scenarios and there's a lot of childhood kind of whimsy and in her character just alone so for so when when you know the whole that these two characters start having that whole may first encounters these creatures these little spirits and she gets to see them um the most often then you kind of like the like satsuki kind of has that kind of older parent kind of adult type of view where she's she's not exactly believing her and at the same time so i think as the story goes along you see this kind of like may may's character actually develops but satsuki also finds this kind of like childhood whimsy that she may have lost because she's had to take in this role of her mother uh, to be more responsible and kind of hide her feelings and you kind of see that kind of bubbling over as as things kind of get more dire as we move for further forward, right? Yeah, of course. I mean, same with the English dub, it, the two sisters are voiced by Dakota and Elle Fanning, um, which I think, again, it's another good dub track that we have for this film. And certainly they bring a lot of energy to these characters, which themselves are drawn with a, a lot of high energy. You see, when you look at their movements, they're very sort of high energy and they're sort of like rolling around in the cartwheel and they don't uh, sort of walk anywhere, they just run everywhere um, <laughs> which I think makes it all the more sort of fun to see these sort of characters and I, also it made me wonder I mean this film sort of is set in 1958 sort of post-war Japan and mm. I couldn't help but wonder is that because we're removing the distractions of the modern world so sort of so to speak, that these two children who are sort of like left to find amusement and distraction in the world around them. I mean, the as soon as they arrive at the uh, new house, I mean, they're they're just like so into everything that they're like shaking the crumbling timbers, uh, wondering where why there's acorns running from, falling from the sky, and it's got this sort of like real sort of um, curiosity. To, to all the actions and I can't help but wonder if this had been set like in more modern times would they have been a little more jaded would they have been would they have the sort of like less wonder about them well I mean that's kind of like saying how we grew up compared to say how your children grew up do they have still that same type of curiosity right or that same type of appreciation for the things around them because you know obviously when if you were to talk about the comparison it's kind of the same comparison because we grew up with not so much technology, whereas, you know, our kids grow up with a lot of technology. So do they not have that same wonder for the nature around them or the appreciation for the environment or the little curiosities that, that, that show up, right? Yeah, and it's sort of like um, if they were, if it was like modern setting, it would probably be like all these scenes dedicated to the fact that they don't have access to these modern perks we would have them then having to like adjust to more sort of the laid back country lifestyle whereas these kids they never had these things i mean they they, they rock up in um the back of a moving truck um that they have to hide from the police because it's uh highly illegal to be traveling in the back for all your furniture which mm -hmm. is kind of charming and then as soon as they arrive it's sort of like oh wow look at this look at this <laughs> it's just like they get it's like so hyperactive um, and we also get the introduction of like the soot sprites, which is well, which they're just so wide eyed and in the wonder of the world and, and that, that, um, these little soot sprites just 
are like the most fascinating, exciting thing to them. The soot sprites are, you know, are a wonder to, I think, for most kids. Because before you, I think that, you know, because I watched this when I was so young that for me, that was what this film was about. It was about this magical childhood that these kids were having. And maybe also because of the fact that it was also featuring young girls, that it even ha- added to that level of kind of um, connection to the characters. Because you're watching these little girls and, and then they're, they're going and then they're, they're going and they're seeing all these magical things. And then, and then you start seeing like these little soot sprites with little eyes and they're just bouncing around in the air. And yeah. <laughs> There's so much in this film. I mean, there's no... The other thing about this film, I mean, there's no conflict. There's no... There's no villainous character here at all. It is just pure whimsy um, that that he's sort of, like, shot this film, film with. And it's also a very minimalistic film plot that's got like no conflict um in there so the whole time is just basically watching these two sisters in particular the younger sister and she discovers um discovers totoro and the more that the more time that they spend there the more these spirits that they encounter um as she forms this sort of like almost like imaginary friend um sort of style friendship with this this forest spirit who just randomly turns up uh to to help her and in and sort of introduces the other spirits to the forest so i wouldn't say like there's no conflict i would just say that the film itself sets itself in this really family kind of environment like a very rural setting and and the conflicts that happen is the conflict that main conflict that happens is really surrounding the mother and the you know the suspicion that something has happened to her and and you know it's it's a very like family like very like like you said minimalistic type of plot because you know like you don't have those big villains or whatever that we normally have with other Totoro films like other other Miyazaki films where you have like um, you know, some witch or some other, you know, some other threatening force that's out there to get you. But in this one, it's 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 just about something that happens at home. So if you think about like as as I was watching this this time, I actually maybe because it was so recent for me that I saw that film, it actually made me think a bit about Minari, and kind of it had kind of that same type of feeling where it was just like you had all these people who were going through like, cause Minari is the same thing as some guy who wants to build a farm. Yeah. <laughs> some immigrants who want to, you know, be involved in the community and, and go and move to the rural area for his kids, but also for, to, to also grow his farm, like his, his garden and whatever, and sell the, the, the vegetables and all that stuff. And the mishaps that comes from it. And in that same kind of comparison, Totoro is kind of the same thing because these kids, I think that in this term, it's more like the kid's world is very small and that's what he's trying to capture is that a child's world is revolving, especially for May when as, you know, about like she's supposed to be about four years old or something like that. Then she, her world is her family. It's her sisters. It's her parents. And these things that are going on around her because she has to find these little things that are kind of, you know, that she finds will entertain herself because she doesn't have school. She doesn't have any of those things um, that that her sister will have or her dad has a job and that sort of thing. And her world is this. So when something happens to, say, her mom, this is like a part of her is still not really comprehending that, yeah, her mom's sick. But what is the sickness that we never know about? And then what happens to her and and to her it's just like when something happens and no one explains it to her then you know all these conflicts happen because well you know her sister doesn't want to tell her but she's kind of like moping on her own and trying to control her feelings but having a hard time of doing that and as she also throws a tantrum then things kind of fall apart right and and that's when the 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 thing happens is it the 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 conflict happens is when we don't know where may goes and then satsuki has to go and look for her and and you don't know what happens to her in that in that in that sense and so the world's so 
Totoro's scope is very, it's like in a very, very small, it's very small family based. But I think that it's because it's like that, that like not a lot of films or animation even take that route that I understand some, for some people that this feels very, I guess it's not, it's not as fun to watch because, you know, who doesn't like to have some big villain, you know, and something that really gives you some, you know, something to to feel like, oh, you know, you're, some, you're fighting against something, right? But in some ways, it, it's kind of the same as, I feel like it's, it's very similar to, you know, Grave of the Fireflies in that sense where, sure, Grave of the Fireflies is set during war and two brothers who are trying to survive this war. Um, but at the same time, like, Grave of Fireflies is also focused on them too only. Yeah, I mean, this is the problem because so, so familiar with the character Totoro before I first saw this film originally that when you finally get around to uh, to watching it, it's sort of like, oh, that, that was nice, but what of it? <laughs> it's really, it was uh, what I, was my main sort of takeaway because I said it was sort of like, it felt like a little whimsy from the screen. I mean, there's even a cat bus um, which takes him on a, a magical uh, ride at a, in a couple of the scenes here, which it's all very sort of charming, but it sort of like felt that without the sort of conflict, they the film kind of lost something. And I think coming back to this and repeat viewing, and you realize that you know this is what he wanted. He's just he wanted to create a film that was sort of like safe for younger viewers to sort of lose themselves in without sort of like the mm-hmm. the um, the sort of the darker side of uh, of needing to be there and. Certainly, I mean, he still manages to get all his favorite themes in there. Um, you know, even Totoro flies for Christ's sake. <laughs> um, and we get more scenes of young girls cleaning things. Um, then do we? Do you also see in like scenes such as like the environment, which would obviously become such a key part of his his work and we obviously saw it with Nausicaa Valley of the Wind um, and here we certainly see it with this film as well this blending of nature and the the, the modern world um, coming to, together and here it's certainly a much more sort of tranquil one than compared to like some of the other films that uh, Sue Ghibli put out, things such as like Spirited Away, Prince of Monoki, even things like Pompoko um, I mean the original story story of this one saw like was be like set in ancient times and it saw like tribes of humans battling tribes of Totoro uh, which the Totoro would actually lose and the, the remaining few would be their, their sort of surviving generations would settle in modern day Tokyo which got reworked into uh, Isio Takahata's uh, Pompoko which uh, featured the mm-hmm. shape-shifting um, raccoons which I really like Pompoka, but nobody ever seems to give it any any sort of uh, credit. Yeah, Pompoko is pretty cute too. I think I think like Pompoko is kind of like Miyazaki's answer to Peter Rabbit, if any, if there was one. It sees, there's so many elements of Pompoka that I really like, like the fact that they drum their stomachs and they can shape shift into yeah. into things, and that when they get knocked, to... I know it. Absolutely, it's it's super super charming, and I think it's it's one of those like Studio Ghibli underrated films that people really don't that haven't seen enough, you know, because everybody knows Miyazaki and only really associates his movies with Studio yeah. Ghibli. But it's just there there are so many other other ones that have so much charm, and it doesn't ha- and it's not exactly you know Miyazaki who who he might be in, involved in like production and stuff like that, but. He's not, you know, the director or anything. Oh yeah, then this is again with Sue Ghibli. It's not just a a one man operation. It's <laughs> even though it's Miyazaki is like the name that you instantly associate with uh, the studio. So there's um there's a lot of some films in there. I mean, obviously things like Whisper of the Heart and um, yeah. that uh, we just people, people just tend to look over. They just tend to focus on the same ones. And I think my name is Totoro is probably got the most lasting appeal of them um i just as i said i just i think if i saw this when i was younger i might have to hold this in like high regards and place it as something like you know the goonies for example but instead it's mm. there's something about uh 
my code dead self that uh, can never like fully like get on board with this one. Yes, I enjoy the experience, but it's not one that I still like feel myself to uh, rush back to watch all the time. So, and I think it's just that lack of uh, the lack of danger in it, or just just a engaging sort of story. So instead, it's just like whimsy and um, that it, it bombards you with instead. I definitely know where you're coming from because. I think that a part of why I like the film is right now is a lot of it is nostalgia. Um, I still remember, you know, the the whimsy and the charm and, you know, just how magical the whole movie was. And uh, but but then, you know, like when you think about it, I'm watching it now and I'm like, you know, part of it is the Cantonese dub had these like effects that. These the little Totoros and even the you know the little especially the little Totoros as May's chasing around the, with them, that they make these like sound effects. But when you look at the English dub, and I think I even looked at the Japanese dub, they don't actually have any sound effects. They just kind of like run, you know. <laughs> and then there's like the music in the background, and then <laughs> and then that's it. But then, you know, when you watch the Cantonese version, they used to have like these little like sound effects and it would make it so it would make it so cute because as you're watching this, this this kind of grabs you inside a little bit more. Yeah. I mean, do you have a favorite sort of character in this film at all? I mean, you know, like it, it, it's obvious it's like Totoro. <laughs> The little little Totoros are always cute. Yeah, I mean, obviously uh, Totoro is a uh, is an easy one to 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 like. I mean, it's this big dopey thing. Um, do you, I mean? I was very surprised first time I watched this. That he doesn't speak either. He just has little. He just roars and yawns a lot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I think that that's the charm, right? Because you're looking at at this, you know, big furry creature and. And who doesn't kind of like this? Because you start from, you start the film and it kind of grows because you start with little, little, like little fur balls of little fur cotton, black little soot yeah. spirits. And then as you, and then she goes into the garden and then she sees like a little spirit and then a bigger spirit and then the giant spirit. And, and then, you know, obviously it, it's such a wonder to watch as you know, she goes through this process of seeing, you know, seeing the the character, the the this the the amount of spirits that she's seeing, and it's just so wonder. It's a wonder to her, especially because you know the um, she's calling she's calling him Totoro, but it's it, she actually thinks he's a troll. <laughs> so yeah, because it draws comparisons to the. Uh... <laughs> Billy goes gruff. Something else I forgot to uh, to mention as well. I mean, I didn't realize that uh, Frank Welker um, redid the dub for Totoro. I thought it was just they kept the they didn't uh, bother to redub them because I mean, in the Japanese version, it's uh, done by Hitoshi uh, Takagi, uh, but obviously Frank Welker does the voice acting, and Frank Welker. Is someone a uh, well, voice actually you probably know, but you probably don't know him by name. Um, since he's been, he's I'm just checking his credits now. He's currently got over 860 film, television, and video game credits. Um, and has voiced everything from Jabador, Speed Buggy, he's done work on the Smiths, um, he voiced Garfield. He did Galvatron and Soundwave and Transformers, as well as Megatron. Um, and he also voices Fred in Scooby Doo. <laughs> um, as well as Astro <laughs> in Jetsons. Yes. He does a lot of like, and he does the big, um, the big sand um, lion thing in Aladdin. Mm. Um, so it's. Kind of funny when you uh, when you think of uh, how you think of all these uh, these these voice actors whose voices are so familiar yet you never have a name to put to put with them. So, but he didn't he didn't get to voice get Megatron until the fifth film, uh, the last night, because there was a big um, 
big hoo-ha about getting the original voice actors back to do the Transformers. But, um, yeah, they didn't get him back until the fifth one, which is really bizarre, because Hugo Weaving, I think, did the first three as Megatron. Not that it was the most in-depth role we had to do for this one, so... <laughs> yeah, but that that but that's the, but that's like the interesting thing. That's why I brought up the point is that I, of why I I thought like the Cantonese dub was different also because they actually gave the person who did the voice acting for that actually had even more you know they even added more sounds to the characters than than the original had, and I think that that also added some charm to it. Um. But yeah, I mean, you know, like, another part of Totoro is, I really like is, I think, that the soundtrack, especially, like, the opening soundtrack is so, it's so, uh, <laughs> it's, like, it, it, it's so familiar now. And I think they actually ended up using it as, um, as, like, some of the, uh, the, the other openings for future films, but I, I can't be sure. It's, the, I remember the, I couldn't remember, like, the opening track to this one, and it's why it caught me by surprise. The opening song I couldn't remember ever hearing before, so I wasn't sure that had been added to the most recent uh, dub, which was the 2005 Walt Disney one. Um, but mm. the end song I always remember, I think that's what, it stuck with me <laughs> since the first time I, I uh, saw it, so. But, um, yeah, this. I think this is the score in this one's a lot more subtle than like when we look at like like Laputa that had a much more sort of soaring sort of score to it. Um, the score for this one, I mean, do you sort of rate it at all? Or? Oh, I love I love the score. I think that Totoro has. I think one of the reasons I like it is because it has one of the more like obviously whimsical scores in it that really match with the the film itself and it's it's really it's it's so fun because some of the other stories scores that we have as we go along we're gonna hear it and it 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 it, it, it's more adventurous it's more that sort of thing but this one is is really like even everything is so upbeat and really really cute and for the most part obviously there's a few that are a little bit more toned down but um i i actually don't really think it's as subtle as as the other ones this one is actually kind of really you know there when at the appropriate moments so yeah i mean obviously i think even though I've sort of appreciated more on the rewatch than I have from previous ones, um, this still isn't sort of like a top tier one for me. The character certainly is, but not the film. Um, but um, yeah, it's as I said, it's uh, it, it's hard to <laughs> to think of Ghibli without thinking of Totoro, though. He, you can understand why he became their mascot. Yeah, for sure. I mean. There, there's there's a lot to love about the the film, especially because, you know, obviously Totoro was such a lovable character that even if you haven't seen this, you know what it represents. And it's almost it, it's, you know, the, the symbol of Studio Ghibli. And that's what makes this film, I guess. I wonder sometimes whether this is one of the films that he really holds closest to his heart because it's, it's so, you know, maybe this is the one that's the most toned down that he's done. Um, you know, so quiet and, you know, not a lot of conflict and everything just kind of focusing around, um, like just rural living and, and the environment and, you know, like just childhood's childhood whimsy. You know? Yeah, I mean, certainly obviously it has got the link to his own past and you combine that with the fact that he based the character May on his own niece. So I'd definitely say there is a real personal connection to this film. Um that um, perhaps it, he doesn't help with his other films, but yeah, it's, um, I think, I, I don't, I'm thinking it's, uh, while there's obviously a little, there's no threat in this one, I never seem to like recommend this as a starting point for people who start getting into Studio Ghibli. I always say something like Spirit Away or House Moving Castle, if they're feeling a little adventurous, maybe something like, um, uh, Princess Mononoke, but uh, no, but this one is never my go to when it's like comes to oh, if you've never seen a studio Ghibli, start with this one, even though it should be like it should be because it's the least threatening of them all. So, I think it really depends who you're recommending it to. I think that that's the that's the main determining factor is a lot of times it's 
if I realize someone is able to, you know, take a film like this and and enjoy it, then yeah, obviously, maybe uh, certain certain people that certain of my friends I have recommended um, this film as the starting point. But like, if you're but if you're recommending it for I don't know Western audience, I would recommend this for the first one, okay. I guess. Just because I don't normally associate, I don't know, maybe people are going to like a little bit more adventure. <laughs> so, cool. it's hard to say. It's hard to say. I, I think the movie is really great. Like, it, it is one of my favorites. But at the same time, like, as I think about it sometimes, I'm like, you know, uh, Kiki is very high on my list. And Spirited, uh, Spirited Away is also high on my list. It's some of the films that I've seen the most, um, as well as Howl's Moving Castle. So, um you know, like, I think those are all really, really solid choices, even if you were going to recommend a film. Um, uh, yeah. Cool. <laughs> well, this brings us into tonight's episode. Thank you, as always, for listening. I apologize about any random background noise you may be hearing in this episode. If you haven't done already, please do hit the like and subscribe button wherever you happen to be listening to this episode. And leave us a review. Let us know what you think of the show. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, as well as checking our blog with smooths and teapodcast.wordpress.com. But, uh, Kim, where are we going to next in our jaunt for the Miyazaki filmography? Yeah, we're going to 1989's Kiki's Delivery Service. The whimsy just keeps coming. But at least this one's got a little more of a story to it. But, uh, yes, Kiki's Delivery Service is another of my firm favourites, the Ghibli Pack catalogue, if not just films in general um i think this one's uh, certainly high up there for myself so be exciting to uh look at this one and uh and certainly uh hear your thoughts now but um until uh next time thank you so much for listening thank you to my cousin kim and we'll be back next time to talk about kiki's delivery service until then good night <laughs>